be publishing um, books about the possibility that even the sun was inhabit in inhabited and so on, which at the time I thought was quite strange. But now in hindsight, I realize that um, people have speculated about life in the sun for over 150 years, so it's not such a strange idea, perhaps. Then after that, I, I well, I went to the States in 1990, uh, when I was 18 years old, and I, I met some of these uh, writers then. In 1991, I came to Spain, and uh, that was a big adventure too. <laughs> There's a whole story there. But uh, I just came here with lots of notes and books and things, and with the idea of uh, researching uh, European folklore, looking for more information, about ancient UFOs, anomalies in general. Well, here I am all these, all these years later. So I, I got into the uh, UFO community here in Spain. I was accepted into that, and it just started that way, I suppose. Let me go back to what you said at the beginning of your answer, that you had a couple of personal experiences. Would you care to give us the basics? Well, I became interested in uh, parapsychology when I was about 13 because I felt that I'd, I'd heard voices of some kind and it was quite specific information. So I decided that either I was some kind of um, radio transmitter, uh, transmitter or I was experiencing a, anything, psychosis or whatever. I, I began to research it and I discovered a whole world of, um, of well, uh, interesting experiences experiences, uh, anomalies, uh, books on psychiatry and so on. And that, in a sense, drove me uh, further into um, parapsychology. But uh, I wouldn't be able to say that um, I, I believe any of the experiences I had at that age were, were either unique or, or, or paranormal. But it certainly inspired me to get deeper into this field. Again, how old were you when this happened? Um, I, was, I was around 13 years old. I used to, um, well, I won't, I won't. That's when you had your experiences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that, then I had them over a, a period of years. But I was more interested in, in you know, uh, finding any kind of explanation I could. And I, I also discovered, I remember that many uh, young teenagers uh, had this kind of, of experience. And um, I didn't feel particularly um, strange. Or, or, or unique in that sense. And I began getting um, all kinds of uh, literature on uh, psychiatry, psychoses, and, and so on, to see if I could find some kind of explanation. But, you know, I mean, uh, now I'm, uh, I was 13 then, and uh, that was uh, 30 years ago. So um, I would look upon that today from a different level of, of maturity and, uh, and experience. Well, uh, slightly better um, understanding of science. But it's, it's too late for me to, to test any of that because, of course, it all happened uh, 30 years ago. You mentioned the interest in ancient astronauts. And we know that even Mr. Drake was not the first writer on the subject. You had Trench, of course, another a British author who wrote books on the subject. Also, Desmond Leslie wrote the first part of Flying Saucers Have Landed, the yes. contactee book about the experiences of George Adamski. But a lot of people ignored part one of the book, which was, of course, about ancient astronauts. And I don't know if you ever heard of this guy, Yona Fortner, who wrote under the name Y.N. Ibn Aharon for Jim Mosley's Saucer News. Um, yeah, I, I believe I, I have heard of him, actually. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a name I've come across before, I believe, yeah. He was one of the pioneers he was writing about in the 1950s. But let's get to the area that helps us leap off to the studies you did with Jacques Vallée. Well, if, if you don't mind, if I can just correct you about the idea that he was a pioneer, because I've just been um, writing about uh, the origin of, of the ancient astronaut uh, theory in general. And, you know, there's, there's um, roots uh, of, I mean, there, there were books published and articles published going back to the 18th century uh, in which people uh, speculated that uh, people had come or our ancestors had come from other planets. Uh, there was the um, Austrian missionary, uh, Martin uh, Dobrovzova, 
uh, who was uh, born in 1717, and uh, he he speculated that maybe the uh, the jungles that he was visiting then in in South America were populated by tribes who'd perhaps fallen from space. They'd come from other planets, and then this theory was taken up around 1822 and and discussed a little bit more in in English. Originally, the, he was from he was from Austria, but then it entered the English language around 18 around 1822. But then, even then, I mean, in the 17th century, uh, we have um, Francis Godwin, Bishop of Hereford, who introduced the whole motif of ancient astronauts in a, in a novel, saying that uh, the the Indian tribes uh, of well, the, the Red Indians, he said at that time, uh, of, of America were possibly people who had uh, come from the moon. And 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 so on and so on. The the actual um, the, the the history of of ancient astronauts is 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 vast. I mean, uh, compared to what's been written in the last fifty or sixty years, uh, it's it's a lot older and a lot more interesting. You say a lot more interesting, and we've got a break in a moment for a couple of pieces of business from our benefactors. But I'm going to ask you to begin this with our next segment, and that is why. Are these earlier writings more interesting than the more recent ones with which we are familiar? Once again, remind you, listeners, if you go to thepowercast.com, thepowercast.com, you get a copy when you sign up to our weekly newsletter of Chris O'Brien's Secrets of the Mysterious Valley. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at thepowercast.com. We've got Chris Aubeck with Gene and Chris B. You're in The Paracast. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there's The Coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. Adam here with Midas Resources. Today, October 1st, 2014, gold opened at 1216.90. A one ounce gold coin can be purchased for 1261.65, 630.82 for a half ounce, or 315.41 for a quarter ounce. That's 1261.65, 630.82, and 315.41. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? Wait a sec. Gold and silver is going up while Congress is trying to settle on the next debt increase. And there's no end to this madness. That old 401k and IRA can be converted into physical gold without tax consequences. I explain this in my book, 10 Reasons to Buy Gold. Don't let time slip away. Call for your free copy today, 800-686-2237. Get away from that Washington spin and get honest answers about gold. 800-686-2237. The book is free, 800-686-2237. Summertime is save big time at Herbal Healer Academy. Long-term customers know summer is the time to stock up at HerbalHealer.com. And for new customers, welcome to the web's best place to save on vitamins, minerals, and more. Log on for summer specials, including all sizes of colloidal silver, colloidal minerals, and intestinal freedom on sale. Choose from Herbal Healer's great variety of weight loss products like apple cider vinegar, hoodia, and metabolic complex and pro-metabolic, all on sale now. Also, the anti-parasite intestinal freedom and wormwood plus complex, plus stevia liquid sweetener and the super enzymes, all on sale for summer at HerbalHealer.com. As always, we offer certificate correspondence courses in natural medicine. Enjoy same-day shipping and free online newsletter. Log on now to HerbalHealer.com and look for summer specials to save big with our nation's leader in supplying quality natural medicine and education. Since 1988, Herbal Healer Academy. 
For over five years, you've been hearing about the Berkey guy, so you may know a few things about him. For example, you are well aware of the superior quality and effectiveness of Berkey water filters and accessories. But did you know the Berkeys have had independent lab tests done to prove just how effective they are? It's true, and he can email you the test results. Just visit GoBerkey.com. You may also know that the Berkey guy has helped tens of thousands of people get better prepared. Now here's something you may not know. GoBerkey.com has amazing specials and deals all the time on a wide variety of survival and preparedness products, most ready to ship same day. Visit the Berkey guy at GoBerkey.com and be sure to click the red Products on Sale Now button. You can always call toll-free 877-886-3653. Again, that's 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com, home of the Berkey guy. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. One of those Chris and Chris shows again. We have to stop doing that, repeating the error of our ways, but we just get so many great guests named Chris, we can't do it. Chris Aubeck, who, of course, has been studying UFOs and folklore in antiquity and is co-author with Jacques Vallée of Wonders in the Sky. Now, Chris A., you were telling us at the end of the previous segment how some of those older writings about possible ancient astronauts seem more interesting to you. Why? Well, yes, because um, the theories of, of von Daniken and his predecessors in the um, in the twentieth century, well, they they arose in the in the middle of a period in which science fiction was very popular, and there were there were already uh, science fiction works which discussed the possibility our ancestors had come from other planets. So when the same ideas can be found uh, in books published in the middle of or the beginning of the 19th century uh, in France science fiction was beginning to to, to, to blossom at that time it almost uh, seemed to erupt in a in a kind of vacuum uh, at least uh, it, it didn't have a, a fictional basis so there are many uh, French writers who began to uh, say that the fossils that we find under our feet um, had possibly had possibly fallen from the sky after the explosion of a planet, um, a kind of ninth or tenth planet, or however you want to count them, um, and uh, that people had fallen to Earth uh, among artifacts and uh, pieces of, of masonry and and signs of civilization and and so on, and that um, the animals even the dead ones had been scattered from this wrecked planet uh, in space and uh, fallen on the earth. And this was one of the, the earliest ideas uh, about the origin of fossils. Uh, people wondered whether, or not people, but a certain number of people wondered whether fossils that later Charles Darwin would, would turn into uh, the basis of his theories of evolution had come from another planet. And even this idea really is is a lot older than that because uh, prehistoric tools, uh, flint knives and so on, had often been attributed to beings in space, to intelligences above the sky. So there's a there's a definite vein of interest in the ancient astronaut theory going back many centuries. And even towards the end of the 19th century, just 50 years uh, before it was reintroduced in the, in, the, in the flying saucer age, people were already um, speculating about whether our ancestors had come from outer space. So I find that the history of it to be much more interesting because it emerged in a, uh, an imaginative vacuum, in a sense. Uh, there was nothing in science fiction at the time to, to suggest that it was a popular idea. Well, certainly, let me ask your viewpoint about this. Do you think that what we do report about interactions with higher beings in biblical times, that as far as you're concerned, it does indicate that we got into contact with E.T.? And I'll just say it. Was God the pilot of a spaceship or the general? Well, um, in my opinion, most of the of the cases that are proposed as 
um, abductions or, or UFO sightings in the Bible uh, were not. They were just uh, symbolic representations of God. Or if you, if you look at these at these sightings at these events in their original context, you quickly reach the the conclusion that um, they they were created as stories for a specific purpose. They certainly weren't created so that uh, 2,000 years later we could wonder whether these wheels were made of, of metal and had um, motors attached and so on. I think that virtually every, every story I've, I've seen uh, from a biblical source or an apocryphal source can be explained whether uh, it was a, some kind of symbol uh, or, or sometimes it was just the evolution of a prior, a prior idea, whether that was uh, wheels within wheels and, and uh, whatever uh, Ezekiel uh, said he saw, um, or manifestations of uh, chariots of the gods. Uh, generally speaking, the Bible is not a very good source for, for UFO cases. I wonder how the people who set down the Bible would think about the way today we have billions of people taking words like that literally. I would say that the people who wrote the Bible, um, who were many, many people writing each, each, each part of it over a period of time, uh, would probably think that we're 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 wasting uh, so much um, so well there's so much imagery uh, without giving it any meaning because uh, at that time uh, practically all imagery uh, symbolism and uh, sightings as it were uh, had some kind of meaning they had some kind of uh, function in their original historical context whereas uh, today we we just open any web page on on this matter and we see um, all kinds of uh, strange sightings in the sky and there's absolutely no uh, symbolic uh, um, explanation at all so i imagine that from their, their point of view it would be very surprising that we're not trying to to interpret these strange uh, wonders in the sky in a, um, in a religious or political way. What is your feeling about this personally? Do you think that the beings that we met up with through the ages were visitors from other planets, really? Well, um, it would be a nice idea. Uh, I'm, I'm not against the, the, uh, the possibility that uh, some of the cases that, that we've been collecting uh, over the years show i don't know some sign of of intelligence at least uh, it would be it would be wrong to to think that um that we have to reject all of that material as uh, misinterpretations or fantasies and so on so um i would like to think that uh, among all of that there's some indication of uh, intelligent life or some kind of um, visit from elsewhere. Uh, but my, my interest in, in UFOs doesn't stem from any kind of belief system. And to be honest, uh, if tomorrow it was, it was somehow demonstrated that uh, none of this had a basis in reality, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shake me at all because that's not the reason why I study uh, UFOs and um, folklore and so on. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great. I hope there is signs of extraterrestrial visitation among all these among these uh, stories. Uh, but if there's not, well, that's that's fine too. After the break, I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer one question before Chris B takes over, and that is: now that we are learning more and more about the potential for life of some sort to exist on other planets in the universe, possibly billions of life-bearing planets. We see here now that we possibly have billions of life-bearing worlds, which means possibly some of them are able to travel into space, maybe from star to star, not just planet to planet. Of course, I wouldn't presume to guess whether they can engage some form of warp drive or even if such a thing actually exists. So Chris will ask you in our next segment whether you feel that is, in a way, proof that maybe something like that did happen in the past and is happening now. More to come. Our guest is Chris Aubeck with Gene and Chris B. You're in The Paracast. The nation's largest independently owned and operated talk radio network. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. 
Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of HB extract. It's extremely effective and it starts working in just days. Visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers. And we've never increased our price in over 10 years. That makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it. A healthy heart is a happy heart. Call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. Yeah. Did you want to see me, sir? Well, I did, but now that I do, I'm not so sure. Sir? Johnson, I got a mission for you that could change your life. Oh, good, sir. It involves traveling halfway around the world without so much as half a clue of where you're going and what you're going to do when you get there. Situation normal, sir? Uh-huh. Well, I'll be leading this mission, Johnson, so I'll be telling you what to do. You, sir? That's right, Johnson, and I say first things first. Oh, good plan, sir. And what I say is first is food. Always remember that, Johnson. Food is a big deal. Sir, my brother-in-law can give us a really good deal on some surplus MREs. Johnson, if you've got half a brain and that empty head of yours, you'll Call the freeze-dry guy like I did. That food is better for you. It rehydrates faster, and it's good, Johnson. And it keeps for up to 30 years. Will we be gone that long, sir? Well, I hope not. Now get your supplies organized and meet me down to the pier. At dawn on Sunday, we sail at sunrise. Yes, sir. This adventure is brought to you by the freeze-dry guy. Call 866-404-3663 or visit freezedryguy.com. If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to ProFlowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's ProFlowers.com. Click the mic and enter code PLOW. This is Jacques Vallée. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Chris Aubeck is joining us. We're talking about UFOs, ancient astronauts, folklore, UFOs and history. And before we did the break, I asked him about the fact that more and more evidence of other planets revolving around other star systems has appeared. Supposedly, there's a story now that one of the planets may have water even, although it's the size of Neptune, not the size of Earth. Does that really serve Chris Aubeck as more and more indications of the reality, the possible reality of ancient astronauts being astronauts and of today 
UFOs being visitors from space? Well, at, at least it opens the, the door to interesting new, um, new possibilities, of course. It, it's great to find uh, evidence that planets do exist, which uh, might be life-bearing. And, uh, I mean, statistically, uh, it, it seems to be a certainty that there are other planets uh, which we could call uh, neighbours, in a sense. I mean, they're life, life-bearing neighbours, potentially. The problem really is that there's no evidence that... Um, any of these planets have anything to do with whatever we see here on Earth. Although it's a very nice idea, uh, I would never be able to join those two dots because there's no indication that anything has ever flown from one of those planets that we haven't really seen yet to here on Earth where we don't have any proof either. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be a very nice idea and uh, I hope it's true. And if it hasn't happened already, uh, it would be great if it did happen in the future. As I said before, I'm not really counting on it. It's one theory to explain the kind of stories that we've been collecting. It's not uh, maybe the best theory, but it's it's certainly um, um, among those which deserve the popularity it has. Chris O'Brien here. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome you to the show. I've been a huge fan of Jacques Vallée's for many years, since I was a kid, really. And I was very, very excited to see you as a co-author for uh, Wonders in the Sky. And we were just briefly talking about the Bible uh, before. We have a thread at our forum at forum.theparacast.com where our listeners can ask questions of our guests. And Alien Esquire has an interesting question relating to uh, biblical images. And he asked, to what extent, if any, has your research focused on interpretations and the symbolism of UFO and mythical objects as featured in biblical and or non-secular artwork from historical periods such as the Renaissance? There's been an awful lot made of these strange little craft that are in the background in the sky and in uh, Renaissance paintings and other paintings from the Middle Ages. Um, has your work really focused on any of these? And, and what, uh, what do you make of those? Well, when we were uh, compiling the book, we did consider having a section on UFOs in art. The, the idea is very nice that uh, over the centuries, uh, UFOs have been depicted uh, in artworks and, uh, yeah, why not, you know, on, on cave walls and so on. The problem that I personally have with this, and, you know, after discussing it with, uh, with Jax, we, we sort of came to this conclusion, I suppose, that... Uh, there's no real indication in any of these paintings that what they were depicting was uh, the UFO phenomenon or the UFO phenomena. What we see in general are religious uh, symbols, uh, whether that's uh, eyes, I mean, it could be eyes or triangles or angels and so on and so on, which made a lot of sense uh, when they were painted to the painter, and they made a lot of sense to the people who were paying for the painting too, because uh, most of these uh, pictures uh, were, were were made to order, basically, and um, each element in these pictures uh, made sense to the people of the time, otherwise they probably wouldn't have uh, risked uh, their jobs to create them and uh, and sell them to, to noble families and so on. So I would say that we have to look at uh, paintings representing UFOs with a certain amount of skepticism because we need to put everything in context. And there are some very good resources uh, on the on the internet which show where many of these uh, shapes come from. If, if we find some picture uh, of, uh, of a UFO phenomenon uh, which cannot be explained uh, in a religious way, it would definitely go in the next version of, of the book. So far, we haven't really found one. The problem with interpreting uh, images in paintings and uh, on walls, cave walls, graffiti and so on from thousands of years ago is that we have a very preconceived idea of, of what a UFO should look like. Uh, therefore, when we see thousands upon thousands of completely abstract and random shapes written on walls, we naturally look or pay more attention to those which look a little bit more like uh, the UFOs that we've come to know over the last 50 years. 
the the problem in my opinion though is that um our view of what ufos should look like is also uh, a little twisted and has been um has evolved over over the years which is why in the 1950s 60s 70s it was very popular in ancient astronaut books to to show any creature with antennae um, um, as if they were Martians or Venusians, uh, because uh, for a long time that's how we depicted extraterrestrials with uh, two antennae on top of their heads, which is really just a remnant of um, the revolution that uh, radio technology caused right. um, in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> like my favorite Martian, the TV show from the early 60s. Exactly. Ray Walston with his, his antennas that come up out of his head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have a, a kind of deep-seated and, and probably forgotten awe of technology, of communications technology. If you look at, um, if, you, if you read a book like uh, Haunted Media, for example, which I, I read recently about how um, technology evolved in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, to become a part of our cultural inheritance, uh, we we look we we looked upon new technologies like that, like radio transmitters and so on, uh, as something practically um, parapsychological in itself. Which is why uh, mediums in the nineteenth century were often um, talking about how uh, spirits communicated using a kind of radio waves, and they would themselves call them themselves like human radios, transmitters, and practically all of the components of of uh, spiritualism in the in the nineteenth century were um, were drawn from uh, new technologies. So when we look at paintings and uh, sketches and things in 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 ancient books in in other media, what we really tend to do we we gravitate towards uh, picking out those which remind us of our own idea of what a UFO looks like. But unfortunately, most of the time it's from uh, science fiction or it's something like that. Because if you look on YouTube today, virtually all UFOs look entirely different. In general, they're just points of light or, or blobs of color in the sky. And um, it would be very difficult to, to find ancient depictions of exactly what we see today as UFO phenomena because uh, they were just these um, amorphous, I mean, t today what we see are uh, normally amorphous shapes. Even the idea of a flying saucer is pretty much an uh, old hat in a sense. Uh, but people seeing a shape that looks just slightly like a flying saucer in an, in an Egyptian tomb or, or somewhere like that would very quickly say, well, there you go, there's a spaceship. Right. It, this is the problem. You, you need some kind of historical perspective of all of this to, to, make, to make sense of it. And a lot of it just comes from our own prejudices and tendencies to find patterns. Right, like a, 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 the prevailing cultural context. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if if tomorrow I find, uh, and I probably will, um, um, a story in an old newspaper that says that uh, angels appeared and they had green skin. I mean, right now, some people will say, well, look, there we have some reptilians. And maybe 30 years ago, they'd say, wow, look, green skin Martians. We can get into that perspective in our next segment. Chris Aubeck joins Gene and Chris B. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Minds think alike. The network for the independent minded. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. 
For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. Have you heard? Proactive Plus is faster and better than ever. Stay tuned for a million bottle giveaway, and you'll also receive free shipping. Do you have troubled skin, acne? Well, we have great news. With Proactive Plus, your acne can heal, and you can help prevent new breakouts from happening. Don't miss this limited time offer. Give us a call at 800 538 5252 because we're going to let a million people try Proactive Plus risk free and get two free gifts and also receive free shipping when you call right now. You heard it. This offer won't last long. So call Proactive Plus now and you'll receive a 60 day risk free trial of Proactive Plus, two free extras, and free shipping. Call 800 538 5252. This is our exclusive radio offer, never on TV. Get your risk free 60 day trial of Proactive Plus with free shipping. That's right, free shipping. Don't wait. Call 800 538 5252. That's 800 538 5252. I will never forget the day my son Jeremy told me he hated me and slammed the door in my face. I'm behavioral therapist Janet Lehman. Behavior problems can turn the child you love and your life into a nightmare. That's why my husband James and I created the Total Transformation, the step-by-step program that shows you how to fix the worst behavior problems and get your child to respect and listen to you again. No matter what the behavior, defiance, backtalk, angry outbursts, disrespect, we can help you stop it. Now you can get the total transformation for free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. You can keep it forever for free. Limited number of free programs available. Call now. 1-888-912-1595. 1-888-912-1595. That's 1-888-912-1595. 1-888-912-1595. Nine one two one five nine five. Hi, my name is DeRay. Suffering from migraines, having Botox injections in my head and neck to alleviate pain, costing $1,500 out of my pocket. I discovered Dr. Ortman and Gentle Touch Chiropractic Adjustment called Nuka. I'm migraine-free since my first adjustment. Thanks for giving me my life back, Dr. Ortman. I wish they prescribed you instead of Botox. Thanks, DeRay. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the solution. We design a nutritional supplement program the body can handle, actually absorb, providing nutrients, targeting the problem area. Between Nuka and Nutrition, we will have you on the road to a faster and more permanent recovery. Look us up on the web at drwartman.com or call 952-303-9124. Let us help you feel better faster. Wellspring Spinal Care at 952-303-9124. Again, that's 952-303-9124 or on the web at drortman.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? So, Chris Aubeck, what we're saying here is we're viewing these in accordance with the cultural perceptions of the time. So, that, right. okay. so depending on what we envision aliens to be, that's what we get. What we see is what we get. Of course, the big question is, therefore, what is the reality without the cultural interpretation? Well, I think it's necessary to change the way we, we look at UFO cases. Uh, it, this is something that I'm working on now. Um, I have a, um, a project which I've been working on for a couple of years with another ufologist uh, called uh, Martin Schoff, who is uh, another British ufologist. And really, the, he's, he's, uh, an inc- he has an incredible brain for, for analyzing analyzing UFO reports, particularly um, historical ones, which is what we're focusing on, um, using all kinds of, of um, resources that, that weren't available before. And I'm referring to uh, digital um, sort of digital observatories and things so we can calculate the positions of the stars and the planet on any day, any hour in history. Um, he also has a, a deep knowledge of, of geography and um, geophysics, meteorology and so on. So I'm working very closely with him to make sense uh, as many uh, historical reports as possible. And we're compiling uh, many of these now. 
as part of this project, which uh, we hope to release in the near future. And it's going to be the first time anyone's ever approached the subject of uh, historical uh, UFOs in this way. That is, we're going to be looking very deeply into every technical aspect and possible interpretation of, of every report that we've um, the, the, that we want to to analyze or which impresses us for, for not resembling um, a natural phenomenon or or something like that so with what I consider this new wave of um, of ufologists using resources that weren't really available 20 or 30 years ago we're going to be able to strip um, a lot of these stories of their uh, archaic sounding or flowery content, their, their religious symbolism, and get down to what exactly the witnesses saw, if they saw anything at all. And um, it's interesting because in the we've we've taken uh, books of, of omens, uh, prodigies, and so on from the uh, 17th century, for example, which in general are are either embraced by by ufologists uh, in the know of of historical UFOs um, as evidence of um, alien visitation or whatever. They are rejected wholesale by folklorists and historians as uh, the imaginations of um, of people with a with a political axe to grind what i've been doing with martin and him particularly with with all his uh, scientific uh, resources and knowledge is to see if there was a kernel of truth behind these uh, very old uh, old cases and we're discovering that Many of them uh, do correspond with actual sightings, whether that, that was um, um, a meteor shower or some kind of juxtaposition of planets um, and so on. And this sort of gives us some hope in a sense, because if we can show that a high percentage of archaic cases were based on actual sightings of, 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 of real anomalies, at that time they were considered anomalies and not today, then the cases which are even more anomalous, which are very strange, which one might describe a, um, a cube with, with arms and legs or whatever, um, maybe they too had a, a basis in reality. So what we're doing, we're looking at everything from the topography to the, to the, um, the, the witnesses themselves, their lives, uh, the weather at the time in many of these places, Using digital resources, we can get very deep into these cases these days and just, as I said, strip away a lot of this symbolism to see what's left. And we've come to the conclusion that many of these cases do, in fact, show uh, anomalies. The thing I wonder about here is we have enough trouble figuring out what somebody said 20 minutes ago. Mm. And you look at, for example, political talk radio or cable TV news, especially in the U.S., they can't agree what somebody said 20 minutes ago. So how do we presume to understand what somebody meant 2,000 years ago? Well, uh, 2,000 years ago would be very difficult. We, we focus mainly on the last two centuries. Uh, the, the good thing is that because of the digitalization of, of public libraries uh, by Google and uh, by practically every library, uh, some way or another, whether independently or not, or through um, a commercial company like uh, newspaperarchive.com, we can find a lot of reports made by scientists or by soldiers or politicians, people who had absolutely no reason to invent what they were what they were describing, and they just put into their own words uh, the content of their sighting. They just described exactly what they saw, uh, which is very different from other periods in history when there was um, this tendency to to invent stories uh, to give them um, well to to prove some religious or political point by concentrating on on the on scientific journals or at least on the observations of of people who had no reason to invent the, um, the tales, such as um, captains of ships, for example. We can find a whole series of, of reliable accounts. And of course, today too, uh, which again I'm, I'm working on with, uh, with Martin Schaff, uh, we were able to, to uh, check 
many of the of the smaller details in the statement. So if someone says he was looking through the west window and saw a certain thing over a mountain on a, um, uh, on a particular date at a certain hour, and at the same time he saw the moon in a certain position of the sky, um, we can check those details. And once you find uh, enough details that correspond with reality, you end up uh, sort of taking a, at face value, in a sense, uh, the rest of their of their testimony. But it takes a lot of a, a lot of research. The problem, in my opinion, is that uh, most of the people who who advocate uh, the reality of UFOs, who defend it. Um, acknowledge that it's a scientific problem, really, whether it's we're talking about parallel universes or whether it's visits from another another planet or whether it's all from the human mind. It's a scientific problem. So it would be difficult to to expect people who are only trained in journalism and just sharing this information in a narrative sense, uh, as many books do, to be able to to analyze these reports correctly. So that's that I think is the future of UFOs. It's the of, of this subject. It's to be able to analyze things using modern resources and getting to the kernel of truth. And um, it, there, there has to be a kind of revolution in, in this subject because, I mean, even young kids these days have access to Google and all of these, all of these instruments one day are going to look uh, very easy to use. But don't you wonder this great emphasis on the fact that it must be ET UFOs, can't be anything else but ET. We need to get the message about our ET visitors out, that the government knows the truth and we want disclosure. Don't you think that really inhibits proper research into what's going on? Um, well, you know, I don't. I haven't watched TV since the year two thousand and three, and I don't buy any of these UFO magazines and and so on. I don't subscribe to anything, and I just work with the material on my own um, or with or in collaboration with with a colleague. So um, I I don't find any of these any of these books and magazines to interfere with the process of research. Uh, I think that um, if 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 you if you focus your i mean on these on these materials on this media as a as your main source of information <laughs> then sure yeah oh boy but, the taint <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's a problem that we um discuss here at the paracast uh, quite often is how people i think uh have become lazy uh they tend to become educated by the media, um, by some of these uh, TV shows that, that are there to actually sell soap and, and fill up uh, spaces between advertising blocks. And it's unfortunate that uh, the, the culture, I think by and large, is being swayed by a Hollywoodized sort of pop culture version of these events. And it's good that you've, uh, you've stayed above the fray and that you haven't been slimed or tainted intellectually uh, <laughs> by this very unfortunate and um, I would say almost, um, I don't know, disturbing uh, trend that's going on, at least in, in the Western culture. And uh, it, it's just, you know, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to find good researchers and good authors and to do your own research, uh, listeners, and, and make up your own mind based on on, on really well thought out uh, research. Chris Aubeck is here with Chris B and Gene, or Chris O and Gene, or however you want it. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com.
We the people grow cotton, we fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. On Facebook, on the news, and in conversations with friends, we're bombarded every day with advice on how to be healthier, from gluten-free and non-GMO diets to how much exercise and sleep the body needs. But how much have you heard about alkalizing the body? AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops are a holistic and natural way to get your body's pH levels back in balance. Just a few drops in water will help your body rid itself of harmful waste. And even the healthiest of diets can be complemented with your daily use of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops. Who isn't looking for more vibrance, vigor, and energy? Now buy two bottles of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops and get $10 off your order. Visit AlkaVision.com or call 800-518-7615. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops are packed with a powerful combination of the most alkaline minerals and compounds. Open the door to greater health, vitality, and zest for life. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health. Call 800-518-7615 or head to AlkaVision.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We have Chris Aubeck. He wrote with Jacques Vallée, Wonders in the Sky, examining more than 500 selected report of sightings through the ages. Chris B. has more to say. You know, in going through the book, I was really surprised to see a number of sighting events that actually were quite extensive that went across uh, entire countries that were probably seen by thousands of people. Do you want to highlight a couple of those real uh, spectacular um, sighting events that uh, that you feel were not mundane celestial events that appeared to have some sort of intelligence behind it or maneuverability, let's say? Sure, yeah. If I can just say that normally when when an, uh, a phenomenon is seen over a very wide area, it normally indicates some kind of um, astronomical source rather than a, a little object. Usually if, if something is seen in a, in a small locality, uh, if it's just limited by region, if it's just seen within a province or a town, then it's generally something which uh, has come down and is very particular to, to that moment and it's probably not a comet. Most of the time when something is seen far up in the sky and it, it can be seen over a whole country and thousands of people over different uh, regions, it, it's, not, it's not usually a UFO. It's, it's normally something uh, quite natural. In any case, yeah, I have a couple of, uh, of cases here which uh, I'm happy to read and uh, you can tell me what you think. Um, there's one which was published in the Richmond Democrat in a Ray County in Montana on the 14th of June in 1888. I find this one interesting. Let's see what do you think. It says, uh, though the, the title was What Was It? Which is a very typical title of anomaly reports uh, of the 19th century. A strange phenomenon is reported at Sibley, Iowa. A correspondent of the, C of the Shoe City Journal says that on Sunday, the 19th uh, instant, an egg-shaped cloud was seen near Sibley, which gradually lowered itself until about 15 feet from the ground when it began rolling after the fashion of a ball. It followed the course of a small stream, reaching a pasture the phenomenon rolled bodily into a herd of cattle, deliberately laid hold of a fine steer and carried him about 300 yards and let him down on the opposite side of a barbed wire fence. It then slowly rose upward and with a dull report burst and almost instantly vanished. Uh, he said that aside from a few scattering clouds, the heavens were clear at the time. It ends with the comment, which is what they often put at the end of these uh, articles or stories. The whiskey sold by Iowa drugstores must be a villainous compound. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shades of Alexander Hamilton in the Yates Center, Kansas case. 
That's right. It, it, Which it, would it have been about did. what? I guess uh, nine years later. Well, yeah, that would have been, um, yeah, approximately. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I recall from my own research uh, in Colorado, a, uh, in northern New Mexico, a very interesting 1888 uh, event that happened outside of Galisteo, New Mexico. Um, during a town picnic, a, a fish-shaped object uh, descended within plain sight of uh, quite a number of people. And strange uh, little creatures got out and appeared to get into an argument. They were yelling at each other and pointing their fingers, and they got aboard their craft and uh, and took off. Uh, do you recall that one? I don't remember if I saw that in the book or not. Um, well, that wouldn't have appeared in the book because we stopped at 1879. Oh, okay. I don't remember that case uh, offhand. Uh, I mean, uh, Galisteo Junction is famous for uh, a sighting. I think there's been a, a small confusion there because um, in March 1880, uh, ne a New Mexican newspaper announced that a, a mysterious aerial phantom had appeared at uh, Galisteo Junction. Yeah, okay, and that's it. I, I got the date wrong. Right. Uh, basically, it was uh, people looked up and they saw these uh, voices coming from the sky and they see a, a strange balloon and the crew is uh, playing music and this kind of thing. Um, the trouble with this this tale is that uh, it was it was a definite fiction because uh, the people traveling uh, on it were actually well, there was a uh, they, they threw down a note in Chinese on uh, on silk paper and a cup and a flower and so on. And it was a love letter by a, a young Chinese woman. And then uh, her her fiancé, by some incredible chance, just happens to be uh, wandering through um, Galisteo at that time. And uh, someone shows him the, the letter and he says, oh, that's from my fiancé who's traveling in a hot air balloon shaped like a fish. And uh, and so on and so on. So basically, it was, it was just a love uh, a love story of of um, eighteen eighty. But oh it's my, I don't remember all those details. Uh, I better go back and recheck my own my own research. Uh, here's some uh, questions. Uh, we have quite a number of questions actually. Uh, a, a lot of folks are very very uh, enthused about you being on the show, and um, you know you you are able to ID some fairly specific sites um, in some of these ancient uh, sighting reports. And SRL, one of our posters at forum.theparacast.com, is wondering if any of your research has led investigators, archaeologists, or perhaps anthropologists to these ancient sites where possible UAP encounters were cited in the research. And if so, is there anything of value we're sharing? In other words, have you, have you inspired any scientists actually go out and do further work out in the field uh, with some of these reports? If they have, they've been uh, um, very uh, quiet about it. Uh, but on the other hand, I have inspired myself because um, next week on the 8th of October, I'm going to Ohio and um, I, I want to visit a couple of places which uh, I mention in um, a, a book that I'm writing myself now and uh, also um, a case that appears in Wonders in the Sky. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, next week I'll be I'll be visiting a couple of places myself. But as far as scientists have, uh, are concerned, I mean, actual scientists, um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's possible that they've expressed some interest. But then again, uh, as you said before, really, the, uh, we we don't find much evidence of what exactly happened 20 minutes ago. So to find physical evidence of what might have happened 150 years ago is a lot yeah. more difficult. No. Um, here's a question from Team Sheep Squatch, one of our more um, creative uh, posting names at forum.theparacast.com. And he's wondering about uh, ancient reports of abductions or missing time incidents, uh, mm -hmm. let's say uh, from the 1879 period going back. Uh, are there any of these types of reports that could be tied to any sort of UFO activity? Or do you think that yeah. this whole idea is new? Uh, well, uh, the, there are a lot of very interesting uh, stories from, from a very long time ago, and the one that interests me most uh, currently would be the visions of a, of a British um, mystic called Jane Led. And um, this was a, a mystic who, who lived from uh, 1623, uh, sorry, 1623 to 1704. And um, she began to write uh, her visions down in diaries. 
And it's very interesting because we're talking about a 17th century mystic who uh, described, on the one hand, a plethora of, of UFO sightings, very similar to the ones we have today, of, um, of luminous objects that come down through the clouds and then go back up again. Um, she also mentioned um, uh, sort of manifestations of the same thing uh, in her room. Uh, she also talks about uh, her own um, abductions and uh, what she called uh, transportations into the sky. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of the most interesting cases would be that of, uh, of Jane Laird. I spent several years uh, looking into, into her, um, her diaries and into her life, and I'm hoping to, to be able to write about this at some time in the future. Uh, but it really provides a very direct parallel with uh, abduction narratives today. I'm going to ask you more about abductions in a few moments. We have Chris Abeck. Joining us, exploring strange encounters in historical times, which in the book, of course, that he did with Jacques Vallée, Wonders in the Sky, covered the period through 1879. With Gene and Chris B., you're in. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream, a dream that turns out to be a nightmare because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R O C K O I D S, dot com. Mike Stennerson from Midas Resources. At no time in history have precious metals been more important, certainly not in my 22 years in the industry. The dollar has lost over 90% of its value in the last 60 years. No fiat currency has ever survived the government printing presses. Ours is not immune. The time is now to be proactive. 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. Anything tied to the dollar is at risk. CDs, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, stocks, bonds, you name it, so decide. Do you want to leave a legacy of wealth or debt for your family? The choice is yours. Call me at 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. That's 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. Be proactive, not reactive. Call 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. The Genesis Communications Network is one of America's premier broadcasters of captivating talk radio. We thank you for listening. Now, now, just imagine, there are thousands of people who are just as passionate about radio as you are. But what you may not realize is how easy and affordable it is to advertise with us. Radio commercials for your business could be heard on hundreds of radio stations across the U.S. every day. We can help you by creating an effective radio advertising campaign for your company. From script writing to producing your commercials. Commercial, just like the one you're listening to right now. No other network provides the level of customer service we do. When it comes to radio advertising, we are your one-stop shop. And no matter how big or small your business is, we can help. Email us at advertise at GCNlive.com. And an experienced advertising executive will help you take the first step towards driving more customers to your business or website. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. Summertime is save big time at Herbal Healer Academy. Long-term customers know summer is the time to stock up at HerbalHealer.com. And for new customers, welcome to the web's best place to save on vitamins, minerals, and more. 
Log on for summer specials including all sizes of colloidal silver, colloidal minerals, and intestinal freedom on sale. Choose from Herbal Healer's great variety of weight loss products like apple cider vinegar, hudia, and metabolic complex and pro-metabolic all on sale now. Also, the anti-parasite intestinal freedom and wormwood plus complex plus stevia liquid sweetener and the super enzymes all on sale for summer at herbalhealer.com. As always, we offer certificate correspondence courses in natural medicine. Enjoy same-day shipping and free online newsletter. Log on now to HerbalHealer.com and look for summer specials to save big with our nation's leader in supplying quality natural medicine and education. Since 1988, Herbal Healer Academy. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, Chris Aubeck joins us. I have the left field question, which I do. These are the questions that never occur to anyone. There's a perception on the part of some people, and I don't disagree with the premise completely, I think it might happen in some cases, that some of the UFO sightings that we hear about from World War II and later may have been caused by military test aircraft, that some of these abductions were the result of mind control or other kinds of psychological experiments on the part of the military or other agencies. What's your take on that, Chris Aubeck? Um, I'd say that uh, it's it's possible, I suppose. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, testing military devices um, in view of people who don't know what they're seeing is bound to lead to UFO reports. So there's definitely some degree of uh, misidentification in that sense. As far as the idea that uh, I don't know, the government or military people can um, enter into more intimate contact with the human mind and manipulate us and abduct us and so on. Um, I personally haven't seen any evidence for it, but then uh, I don't normally focus on on that period. I mean, most of what I study is from before uh, 1947. Then uh, I, I am interested, however, in uh, this this theory, the the whole conspiration theory, sorry, the whole, the whole conspiracy theory of UFOs and and contact and so on, because it reminds me a lot of uh, of the story of engineer, an Irish engineer who who lived in Australia in the 1860s, uh, Frederick Birmingham, who um, had a, um, a UFO vision. And we mentioned this in Wonders in the Sky. Uh, he basically saw a kind of arc, uh, like a Noah's Ark, um, descend from the sky and uh, in a sort of zigzaggy way. Then he, he meets the, the pilot, or at least the owner of this craft, who tells him that this is basically what he has to build in his own time at some point in the future, and that way he can revolutionize air transport. But this guy who who had this vision and, and wrote about it in a book he called the uh, Memorandum Book, it was just a, a diary really in uh, 1873, he sort of s slowly went mad. And uh, there was a point in which he was trying to sell his, his invention, his blueprints for a, a flying ship. Uh, in the uh, 1870s and 80s. Nobody wanted to buy it from him because it was a very strange idea and it probably wouldn't have worked anyway, but he believed that this is what the spirit of this UFO-type craft had tried to, to get him to do, to, to invent um, an airship and, and sell it to the government. And um, he finally lost his job, uh, probably because he was so obsessed with, with trying to build this machine that he was spending more and more time on it and all his money and so on. And um, he even went to America uh, from Australia to, to try to sell it there. Uh, I'm looking for any kind of uh, cuttings or documents which tell me about his life in America. I haven't found many so far. And uh, he finally came to the conclusion that he'd lost his job and his life had gone totally downhill uh, because uh, Queen Victoria and her government were trying to stop his research. He believed, and probably wrongly, that Queen Victoria ha um, was somehow sort of carrying out a, I don't know, some kind of vendetta or something against him. 
and making him get removed from his government posts because he had a he was he was working in the government at the time and uh, trying to destroy him uh, because uh, he thought that um, Queen Victoria was afraid that if this uh, airship ever fell into enemy hands, then Britain would lose its uh, world dominance. So the idea of a conspiracy theory is very old and um, historically I find it very interesting, but I don't really have an opinion about, about modern ones. I just see them as a kind of development from what came before. That, that kind of reminds me of, you know, but I think what Jacques Vallée would consider his, his probably his most important work, which is uh, Passport to Magonia, which uh, he spent uh, years uh, compiling uh, what he then thought were misinterpreted possible uh, UFO type encounters uh, in the Celtic countries and elsewhere of fairies, uh, leprechauns, brownies, uh, sprite lights, uh, that sort of thing, which harkens back to our conversation about the cultural trappings of the time, kind of fueling the interpretive sense of, of witnesses and uh, how that morphs over time. And, and now that we're a high tech space potentially spacefaring uh, species we tend to see these things and describe them uh, in more high-tech terms do you do you uh, subscribe to that idea that this particular mystery the the truly mysterious part of it is morphing itself over time uh, to be more acceptable to to witnesses or do you think the witnesses are are putting the details on these reports um, I don't think that um, the phenomenon itself is evolving in any way, which is um, probably not a very popular opinion among a lot of your listeners. But I don't, I don't believe that the phenomenon is adapting itself. I think that people have always uh, described strange things and they'll always describe it in their own terms, uh, which is why uh, we find centuries ago tales of flying eyes, uh, flying, there was a, there's actually um, uh, an account from China about flying cups to go with the flying saucers. And uh, people talked about um, um, daggers and swords in the sky and so on. Uh, there's no reason to believe that UFOs adopted the shape of a sword just because people use swords more commonly at the time. And I don't think that um, there's any reason to suppose UFO uh, occupants would uh, adopt the shape of a fairy or a, or a vampire or a witch or a devil uh, just because it was uh, what was seen at the time. Um, it doesn't make um, a great deal of sense to me. I don't know. I, I feel that what contradicts it is that we we believe now what that they're extraterrestrials or something. So so what we see are also adapted to adapted to our expectation of of what they're going to be. I, I don't know. I find it a very strange, um, a very strange concept that the that this changes. But you know, if if you study uh, folklore, uh, the evolution of folklore, mythology, legends, you you discover that historical personages and uh, tales have adapted um, to the expectations of every generation. So if you look back at uh, King Arthur or any any uh, legendary uh, person, whether it's the Greek gods or whoever, they, they just constantly are being adapted by our own culture. I mean, Thor today is a superhero who can travel in a spaceship and so on. I, so personally, no, I don't, I don't believe that uh, the phenomenon evolves to meet our expectations. But if our interpretations are evolving over the years, the big question to ask then is what is really behind it? What is the actual phenomenon shorn of all our interpretations of it or is it so alien to our consciousness that we have to process it in some way? We're going to have to pursue that in our next segment with Chris Aubeck joining us. We also have many, many, many questions from our listeners. And let me remind you, if you subscribe to our weekly Paracast newsletter, you get a copy of the ebook edition of Secrets of the Mysterious Valley from Chris O'Brien. Just go to theparacast.com, theparacast.com. Right there is a sign-up form, and you'll get your newsletter, and we'll get out the ebook copy to you within a few days. With Gene and Chris B., you're in The Paracast. Free from the shackles of corporate America, we're the place for independent thinkers. G-C-N. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. At 30dayfoodsupply.com, you can now purchase a -a one-of-a-kind product not available anywhere else. A meatless burger dry mix in four delicious flavors. With our new Oregon Trail Foods vegan burgers, all you do is add water and fry. They need no refrigeration. They're packaged in Mylar bags with an oxygen absorber for a long shelf life. They're non-GMO. They're gluten, soy, nut, and chemical free, but they're loaded with flavor. And a good source of carbs and protein, yet low in sodium. Flavors include Italian, spicy Mexican, Mexican, six vegetable and black bean olive. Go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010 and order today. Eat them every day, take them camping, or save them for an emergency. Check them out at 30dayfoodsupply.com and click on the vegan burger icon. That's 30dayfoodsupply.com where all of our products are produced in Oregon by Oregon Trail Foods. 30dayfoodsupply.com. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of hb extract it's extremely effective and it starts working in just days visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers and we've never increased our price in over 10 years that makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it a healthy heart is a happy heart call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to ProFlowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's ProFlowers.com. Click the mic and enter code P-L-O-W. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. Chris Aubeck, the question on the table before we get back to listener questions and some from Chris B is, okay, if we're interpreting this in terms of our culture over the years, which we've gone into over and over again, what is the reality behind it all? Well, um, this is probably the, the point in which I, I most, well, I, my opinions differ from those of uh, my co-author, Jax Valley, because I don't see what we call the UFO phenomenon as a, as, a, as a body of phenomenon in itself, that is the manifestation of a single thing. Uh, I, I look at it in a very different way. When we see uh, photos of 
UFOs, videos of UFOs. Uh, generally speaking, we see entirely different ob objects and different phenomena in every single photo. Uh, it's very difficult to find um, uh, two photos of the same object taken um, with a 10 year difference. I mean, it's not that it's, it's, it's not impossible, but it's extremely difficult. Uh, we're always looking at the, the you know, the, the new thing, whether it's a flying banana shaped um, brown objects in the sky, or whether it's uh, red stars, or a green rectangle, or and so on. Whether it's a transparent ball that, a, that uh, lands on a hill, and, and I, um, my my view of all this is that there's I don't see any link between any of these things. Uh, I don't think that a, a fiery triangle has very much in common with a, a, a box with wheels that's seen uh, hopping off into the distance, for example. And uh, so um, I could never answer or try to answer the question, what is the phenomenon? Because I just see a very wide selection of, of things, of different stimuli, of different phenomena. Um, if someone describes to me I don't know, uh, um, a, a weird light that was traveling in circles in the sky. And then uh, his uncle says, yeah, he once saw uh, an object shaped like a fish or a penguin um, but hiding behind a cloud and it was silver. I say, yeah, that's great. But I just see two different things there. I don't. Yeah, this is this is probably one of the fallacies. There's a kind of logical fallacy here in, in ufology that everything that is weird uh, is connected just because it's in the sky. Um, it, for me, it's exactly the same logic as saying, you know, all the kind of um, uh, garbage we see are, are scattered on the ground uh, must be connected, even if it's, you know, there's a there's a can of coke here and a, and a piece of wood over there. I, I, I just don't see any connection between all of these, which is why I find it more interesting to, to study each case individually but uh, I'm unable to to say that uh, this represents a single phenomenon. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and it's well taken. There are a number of uh, reports uh, in the historic record, which you point out in your book, Wonders in the Sky, uh, co-authored with Jacques Vallée, of actual interaction between witnesses and uh, occupants of craft. Uh, I, I seem to recall, um, is it the Asgard case? where I think uh, beans were captured. I don't. I don't have that particular case in front of me. But uh, do you want to oh, yeah, describe? Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a bishop Agobard, a French bishop. Yeah, right. that, 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 that's the whole origin of the of the word Magonia itself. You know, in passport to Magonia. It was uh, uh, at the time in France, um, fifteen hundred years ago. Or so people uh, well, there existed the idea that um, ships could travel in the sky. And they might even capture people from the ground and so on. And uh, they, they come from a, a mysterious place called called Magonia. So there are definitely stories of uh, interaction between between objects and and witnesses. And I find it very interesting that um, that there are stories uh, describing landings with people coming out and so on uh, way back in the in the 19th century in fact if, if you want to i can i can read you one please um this is one that i want to um look into uh when i get to uh, ohio next week it says the, the, the following it uh, it's uh, dated april the 5th 1873 uh, Zanesville, Ohio. To the editor of the Herald, a most extraordinary phenomenon was observed near the village of Taylorsville, a few miles from this city about a week ago. Mr. Thomas Inman, whom your reporter can vouch for as a respectable farmer of unquestionable truth and veracity, related the circumstances to the writer, and with his son, who is also an eyewitness, is willing to make oath to the truth of this statement. One evening about two weeks ago, while Mr. Inman and his son a young man, were returning to their home from Taylorsville, they saw a light which they describe as looking like a burning brush pile near the zenith, descending rapidly towards the earth with a loud roaring noise. It struck the ground in the road a short distance from them. The blazing object flickered and flared for a few moments and then faded into darkness as a man dressed in a complete suit of black and carrying a lantern emerged from it. 
One evening, about two weeks ago, while Mr. Inman and his son, a young man, were returning to their home from Taylorsville, they saw a light which they describe as looking like a burning brush pile near the zenith, descending rapidly towards the earth with a loud roaring noise. It struck the ground in the road a short distance from them. The blazing object flickered and flared for a few moments and then faded into darkness as a man dressed in a complete suit of black and carrying a lantern emerged from it. The man walked a few paces and stepped into a buggy, which had not been observed before by either Mr. Inman or his son. There was no horse attached to this supernatural vehicle, but no sooner had the man taken his seat than it started to run noiselessly, but with great velocity, along the highway, and this it continued to do until it reached a deep gully into which it plunged, when buggy, man and lantern suddenly disappeared as mysteriously as they came. And it ends by saying, this phenomenon is certainly an extraordinary and unexplainable one, and sounds more like the vagary of a crazed brain than anything else. But both Mr. Inman and his son, who are sober men and not given to superstitious uh, notions, agree precisely in their statements and maintain that they are strictly true. So this is a very interesting case for me because in 1873, there wasn't really a body of uh, science fiction or uh, hoax claims in newspapers which spoke about uh, the arrival of a fiery object from the sky which lands or, or crashes, in this case I imagine it lands, uh, in front of witnesses and then uh, it opens or someone comes out, all the, the lights go out, a man in black comes out with a kind of light in his hand, gets into a, a vehicle, which they call a buggy, but there's no horse, there's there's no propulsion method at all, and it just rides away completely noiselessly and, and disappears. Here's, this is what you might call a, a, a close encounter of the third kind from 1873. Although the, the date has raised a bit of suspicion, I mean, April the 5th, it's not April the 1st, um, and it does say that the events had happened a few weeks before this. Um, it's extremely interesting historically that, uh, that they would describe something of this kind. It's unmistakably something from the sky and a supernatural vehicle. I just wonder sometimes when I hear these stories and how our cultural interpretation of UFOs has changed over the years, whether that is the purpose of a phenomenon itself to kind of influence human development by presenting us with the possibilities. Certainly more and more people are interested today in space travel. We see the evidence now of other planets bearing, possibly bearing life. And you wonder maybe the presence of UFOs over the years has started us thinking in different directions that maybe we would not have considered otherwise. That's one of the really crazy questions about the UFO mystery, and maybe Chris Aubeck in our next segment can tell us more about what he thinks or whether he thinks I just posed a wacky question. In other words, to make it blunt, our flying saucers here to make us think. Think about this, folks. If you want to get a free copy of Secrets of the Mysterious Valley by Chris O'Brien, just sign up for our weekly Paracast newsletter. Go to theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. And after that, you will, of course, have the chance to subscribe and you'll get your copy in a couple of days. With Gene and Chris, you're in. Headlines, suspensions, FCC investigations. That's man cow for you. Hear him here. GCN. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com.
So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. Time and time again. You need to come here and help us. We need assistance. Please. Those we should be able to depend on let us down. Federal and state and local officials saying help is on the way. Well, the folks here in Bell Harbor say show me. Don't depend on the government to save you. Take action now so that you're prepared for the next disaster with MyPatriotSupply.com. Get the best prices on storable food, non-GMO seeds, water filtration devices, home canning equipment, survival and self-reliance books, and more at MyPatriotSupply.com. Call 866-229-0927. We are hurting down here, and we need help immediately. Before it's time to survive, it's time to prepare. MyPatriotSupply.com. MyPatriotSupply.com. This alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock-bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right. General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right. That's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturers, if you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. So call 866-91-STEEL. Lock in your price now. Call 866-91-STEEL. That's 866-917-8335. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years in serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. So my long convoluted question, Chris Aubeck, and one not original with Gene Steinberg, but actually goes back to the days of Ray Palmer, are flying saucers here to make us think, think about new frontiers, new possibilities. What do you think? Um, I think that uh, they certainly do make us think, whether that's their, their aim or not. It's another question, but um, they they definitely have uh, made us think. I mean, they've they've got me into this uh, into this subject, and they've got a lot of other people uh, posing questions about the nature of reality and the nature of human experience. And there have been designs of of craft based on on descriptions of of UFOs. Um, In fact, it was uh, sometime at the beginning of the 20th century, I think, I'll say 1906, but I might be slightly wrong, um, that somebody designed um, an airship based on the description given by Ezekiel in the Bible. And uh, this is actually on on display in a museum. I don't have my notes here with me about that, so I don't know exactly where that is. 
But um, so, you know, over over the centuries, people have definitely been inspired by anomalies that they see to understand more. Really, human curiosity originates in in things that uh, we can't immediately understand. So whether UFOs are definitely trying to uh, get us to think or whether the subject of UFOs uh, makes us think even if they don't exist or they're mainly a, a psychosocial um, figment. Uh, I don't know, but it, it's, a, it's definitely a, a pertinent question and, and one that I've pondered quite a lot. Here's an interesting uh, a question that I have, and, and that has to do with patterns. You know, as a, as a field investigator uh, and journalist uh, for many years, I've noticed that these events tend to cluster and they tend to to uh, uh, kind of come in flaps or waves of activity. In looking at an incomplete, obviously, historical record, do you have any sense of, of times where there's been peak periods or waves or flaps of activity and times when there's, uh, there doesn't appear to be any activity at all? Have you looked into that whole idea of patterning? Yeah, it's, um, it's a, a difficult problem because uh, if any event, real or not, helped sell newspapers at some point in history, then it was natural for other newspapers, I mean, whether this is 20th century or, or previously, to, to come up with similar stories to, to sell their newspapers too, because there was a lot of competition uh, among, uh, compu uh, among newspaper editors at some point. So whether um, a flap, a wave, uh, represents actual um, actual sightings seen uh, in mass over um, over a period of time a short period of time or whether we're looking at um, the the spread of folklore the spread of rumors and um, commercializing that somehow uh, to sell more copies of newspapers which is really the objective uh, of, of most UFO cases uh, until they started appearing in books. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. Uh, I mean, um, I have found cases which seem to coincide with uh, poltergeists or with um, other paranormal activities uh, going on in the same area at the same time, uh, working with um, Martin Schoff, uh, this uh, British um, expert in all things uh, meteorological and astronomical, who's, who's doing some amazing work uh, with me using his digital resources and his and his knowledge of meteorology and so on. Um, we found very interesting uh, focuses of, of, of cases uh, where perhaps they see um, a flying starfish. That's one of the cases that, that we found in, from Montana. Um, and at the same time that this was happening, there were what seemed to be poltergeist or, or something like that going on um, quite nearby, uh, in nearby town or by people who were traveling between the two different towns. So um, I think that, yeah, these things uh, seem to happen uh, in bunches, uh, whether that indicates uh, that uh, they really are happening like that or whether this is just um, a way to exploit uh, the initial sighting or not uh, for monetary gain is another question. I mean, what happened during the, the airship wave was basically that. Yeah, and that's, that's been pointed out um, uh, by several researchers that it's hard to separate the wheat from the chafe when it comes to that particular uh, very celebrated wave of activity. Well, how about behavior of objects? I have a question here from Wade Ridsdale, who's one of our, our frequent posters at forum.theparacast.com. In fact, he's almost reached the 3,000 post <laughs> mark. And he's uh, got an interesting question here for you. It says, I don't hear a lot about the falling leaf uh, behavior that's been attributed to the UFO UAP uh, sightings a few de decades back. He doesn't see them in today's reports. Do you have any descriptions in in your database uh, from way back uh, in the historic record of these objects exhibiting this falling leaf uh, type behavior as they uh, if they're descending? 
Well, uh, we we have seen uh, some cases like that. Uh, there was one posted recently. I, I don't I don't have it right now. I mean, as you know, I have uh, this um, international uh, research group, which uh, what we do we we exchange material on on these subjects. Uh, well, practically practically every day, there's something going through the system, and um, I know that at some point we have seen uh, cases mentioning this zigzagging movement. Uh, the, the, the story of uh, Fred Birmingham I mentioned before in Australia in Parramatta, he drew a sketch of the, of the object and it seemed to be descending in a sort of zigzag way. So yeah, I mean, it is, it is possible. Uh, there was also talk about um, the, the luminous thing in Fatima, seen in Fatima in uh, 1917, and the idea that that, that might have descended or moved at least in this uh, zigzag fashion. It, it is something that, that comes up from time to time, but it's definitely not a staple of historical reports and it's not really a staple of modern ones either. So I don't know where that where that came from in the 20th century, but uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if you look at hundreds of thousands of UFO reports over the centuries, you're bound to find patterns uh, very minor ones between movements of objects or colors and shapes. It doesn't always mean that there's a connection there, but it's always interesting to to you know to bear that in mind. You mentioned your project, uh, your database uh, project that you um, have been working on. Uh, this comes from Wade Ridsdale again. Uh, he's wondering about that. He says, at the risk of sounding like a pisser. Despite the names involved, you, Valet, Jerome Clark, Albert Rosales, and others, he was a bit disappointed in it. He thought that within the group there would be more discussion on the events and the effects and the aftermath of recoded events, but it seems to be just hard facts, dates, general observations and sources, that type of thing. And he's more in about the experience, and given the name Magonia, he felt this was a natural assumption on his part. He said, except for two brief periods, he couldn't access this vast treasure trove of information that is already stored. Although being on the mailing list, I would get newer reports as they came in. So he's wondering, what is the status of your, um, you know, your Magonia group? Um, mm -hmm. And is there uh, at some point in the future, will that be made uh, accessible in terms of uh, for researchers uh, looking back into the into the record? Well, um, I founded this with uh, a colleague, uh, Rod Brock, in uh, April 2003. It's called Magonia Exchange, and it's called Magonia Exchange for, uh, for a good reason. Um, firstly, uh, Magonia, of course, is the, um, the word associated with uh, Jack Sully's book, uh, Passport to Magonia, but also with um, folklore and historical UFO sightings in general. But it's also called Exchange for very good reason. And it's because before then, it was very, very difficult to coax uh, researchers into sharing what they had. Um, at home, uh, tucked away in files and drawers and under the bed and, and, and so on, on their hard drives. Um, because, uh, well, we, these days we're, 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 much, um, we're much more used to, to sending things off, uh, scanning a document or even taking a picture with your phone and sending it to someone. But uh, 11 years ago, that really wasn't the case. Uh, there were, there were uh, points, uh, there, were, there were people who, who would collect information and if you wrote to them they might send you something but there wasn't any any system in which people were actively sharing what they already had uh, and in exchange for sharing what they had they would receive um, what others had it's in in a sense it, it's like a forerunner of crowdsourcing or, or or something like that it's in this day and age chris albeck you can get a patent on that <laughs> okay, let's do our break right now. We'll have more to discuss about Magonia Exchange and more with Gene and Chris B. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> We are the premier independent talk radio network. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Imagine looking in the mirror and to your surprise, you look 10 years younger. How would it make you feel? 
Looking younger can be your reality with our breakthrough anti-aging formula that's clinically proven to visibly and dramatically improve wrinkles, lines and skin tone. Call 1-844-500-0815. That's 1-844-500-0815. Or visit imaginelookingyounger.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Question. Could too many GMO foods and toxins be overloading your digestive and immune systems? Answer, yes. If you're searching for a powerful detox that's gentle enough to use every day, use Pro-EM1 from Terraganics. Pro-EM1 is a powerful liquid probiotic that uses good bacteria to suppress pathogens and gently eliminate toxins from your body. A healthy digestive system will cleanse and remove toxins, support weight loss, improve absorption of food nutrients, and aid in controlling yeast and other infections. Pro-EM1 is made with only non-GMO and certified organic ingredients, has no preservatives, and is dairy, soy, wheat, and gluten-free. Pro-EM1 is the key to your digestive health. Order Pro-EM1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganix.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Also available through Amazon Prime. Pro-EM1 from Terraganix. Life's getting better. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Of course, today you've got Kickstarter, you've got GoFundMe when it comes to crowdsourcing. But Chris Abeck, the Magonia Exchange, is this a place the public can visit? to share information, or is it strictly a bunch of you people working together privately? Well, to get the thing started, it was just mainly me and uh, Rod Brock, uh, and we were looking through uh, what then was a novelty, which was um, a digitalized newspaper collections, completely searchable, that would appear on the screen in PDF format and so on, and you could do incredible searches. They might have, I don't know, 60,000 newspapers in their database from all kinds of periods in time, and you could put in there like strange star or singular phenomenon, and, and you'd come up with amazing UFO cases that no one had seen in over 100 years. So we, we started with this, and we shared it between um, so between ourselves in, uh, in Yahoo accounts. At the time, we had, I don't know, 20, 30 Yahoo who accounts and they were just full to the brim with uh, with these things that we were finding because we had no other way to store things this was practically before pen drives existed too it was i mean it was a very very different period and i i began to to suspect that if we could get others to to join us we could get through a lot more information uh, a lot faster i didn't expect uh, that all of the libraries in the world would start digitalizing everything they have. Uh, what that's meant is that we have material there for the rest of our lives. And in fact, uh, since the year 2003, we've managed to to gather, I don't know how, how many, I, I can count posts, like uh, some, sometimes a, a post that we send through the group will contain several different items and the group itself has been through at least three different incarnations. So I'd say about 40,000 items have been shared uh, since the year 2003, which is quite a lot. But to get this started, I had to be a little bit strict with the way this had to be because it's, it's, this, the whole concept didn't exist before and it was strictly if you want to to participate you have to you have to contribute completely free of charge it's open to anyone at all and it still is and absolutely anyone you know someone's mother could join there's absolutely no problem at all but to participate to receive you had to contribute and that and that, that was a philosophy that I had at the beginning and it worked very well particularly when we started getting members in in Russia and, and countries like that where 
people were going to obscure libraries and translating documents for us from Russian, for example, or French, Italian, and so on, and sharing those documents with the rest of the group. Because then I consider, I mean, I'm a translator myself, that's that's my main job in Spain. I consider that um, that in a sense is a kind of intellectual property once you've translated something. I didn't, what I didn't want to happen was that someone would just go in there, take everything, raid all of our thousands of items, and then turn it into books on Amazon. And because that has happened in that, in fact, that happened to uh, Albert Rosales uh, once, and someone just published everything he had. As, as a book. And so, of course, um, he complained and I complained and so on, and it was taken down. So to stop that from happening, so researchers are often quite sort of jealous, possessive people with their material. They, they took a very long time to get it. And, you know, it's like gold dust in a sense, like the jewels of their collection. They, they, they didn't want to share everything they had immediately with, with, with the world. I mean, that is changing. But at the beginning, to, to gain people's uh, trust, in a sense, it was necessary to make a group which was exclusive in the sense that um, you gave as much as you received. That was the, the main philosophy. That what you, what you posted uh, wasn't all going to be available there for someone to raid. The way that it's worked is that if any new people want to join, uh, they have access to absolutely everything that's posted from the day that they join. And if they want to, to get any uh, earlier posts, they can go through the, uh, the, the Yahoo archive, which lists everything that's ever been posted, at least since from the year 2004. And they, they see the title of everything. If they want something, they can ask me or ask someone else, and it can be sent to them. That's, we're not that exclusive. We're not, we're not sort of guarding everything under lock and key. Well, the only thing that we're doing is to create a system that gives people uh, a motive to, to share what they have in order to, re to, to receive. So um, I don't know who, who it was who wrote that. But yeah, he's welcome to join again but I'll be happily knocking him off again if, from the list if he doesn't contribute anything over a period of six months or eight months or whatever it is. As far as discussion is concerned, the, the internet is so full of discussion and forums uh, and everything, and there are TV programs and radio programs and, and everything, possible debates and conferences, that I'm more interested in, in providing a, a source of the original information untouched scans of these ancient documents if possible uh, and just put that out there for people to do their own independent projects and that's exactly what's happened and it's been very successful. Mr. O'Brien. Well we have uh, as Jean mentioned we have a bunch of questions that have been posted by our posters at forum.theparacast.com where you can uh, post questions for our guests and uh, here's another question from one of our German uh, listeners, Polter Wurst, who's one of our, our uh, very frequent posters at forum.theparacast.com. The one, he says, the account in Wonders in the Sky that he personally found the most fascinating was that of Reverend Abraham Cummings, who apparently quite skeptically investigated some alleged sightings of an apparition in 1802 and ended up seeing it himself, a rather small, football-sized, whitish light that morphed and grew into the aberration of a woman. Uh, could you give us uh, some uh, information on that? Do you think this was a genuine, incredible sighting? And uh, have you done any further investigations about it? Yeah, this was a case from 1806. Uh, the Reverend uh, Abraham Cummings, who set out to investigate the apparition of the ghost. And uh, he was a, a serious scholar. He had a Master of Arts degree from Brown University. And he imagined that the tales were going to be uh, fraudulent from the very beginning. Uh, so from that point of view, it's interesting because we're talking about an investigator who, from the very first moment, does not expect what he's going to find. And then what he wrote was that uh, sometime in July 1806 in the evening, I was informed by two persons that they had just seen the spectre in the field. About 10 minutes after, I went out not to see a miracle, for I believed that they'd been mistaken. Looking toward an eminence 12 rods distance from the house, I saw the, there, as I supposed, one of the white rocks. There, there were, because he, the, the people thought that they were rocks, or he thought there might be rocks that people were seeing. He wrote, this confirmed my opinion of their, of their spectre, and I paid no attention to it. Three minutes afterward, I accidentally looked in the same direction, and the white rock was in the air. Uh, its form a complete globe 
with a, a tincture of red and its diameter about two feet. Fully satisfied that this was nothing ordinary, I went towards it uh, for more accurate examination. While my eye was constantly upon it, I went on, on four or five steps when it came to me from the distance of 11 rods as quickly as lightning and instantly assumed a personal form with a female dress, but did not appear taller than a girl seven years old. While I looked upon her, I said in my mind, you are not tall enough for the woman who has so frequently appeared among us. And he was referring to the, the ghost uh, people were seeing. Uh, immediately, she grew up as large and tall as I considered that woman to be. Now she appeared glorious. On her head was a representation of the sun diffusing the luminous rectilinear rays every way to the around. Through the rays, I saw the personal form and the woman's dress. And uh, he said that the entity had been encountered on, on dozens of occasions, and he, he included about 30 affidavits from, from witnesses to prove it. And in all the cases, first there was this small luminous cloud, and then it grew until it took on the, the shape of, of a woman, and then it would sort of disappear in, in about the same way. So uh, this is interesting because we're talking about objects that float up into the sky. Here we have some kind of um, entity, humanoid entity. I also find it interesting because there's a connection here between this and apparitions of the Virgin. And of course, this was a reverend writing too. So whatever he saw, he might have decided to describe it in his own way afterwards. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because we have 30 affidavits, affidavits of, of, of people who, who believe they, they saw this thing. So among cases with uh, a, a good number of witnesses in them, yeah, it's, it's a good one. More to come with Chris Aubeck with Gene and Chris B. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. Gold isn't for you? Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources, one of the world's premier gold and precious metal investing firms. I get it. You wouldn't buy gold if you believed that the government is doing a great job, that the Fed will stop handing out trillions of dollars like bailout candy, that Social Security would be there for you. That's not what's happening. You might even pass on gold if the stimulus package wouldn't fuel inflation, or that the dollar wouldn't lose value, or that your retirement would be secure. If all looks rosy to you, then now is not the time to buy gold. For the realists, there have never been more sobering reasons to diversify with gold. Since 2001, the U.S. dollar index has tanked 30% while gold has risen 300%. Right now, savvy investors are adding gold to their portfolios. You should too. Find out what they know. Call us and I'll send you 10 reasons why gold will do very well, free. 800-686-2237. 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. The Genesis Communications Network is one of America's premier broadcasters of captivating talk radio. We thank you for listening. Now, now, just imagine, there are thousands of people who are just as passionate about radio as you are. But what you may not realize is how easy and affordable it is to advertise with us. Radio commercials for your business could be heard on hundreds of radio stations across the U.S. every day. We can help you by creating an effective radio advertising campaign for your company. From script writing to producing your commercials. 
potential. Just like the one you're listening to right now. No other network provides the level of customer service we do. When it comes to radio advertising, we are your one-stop shop. And no matter how big or small your business is, we can help. Email us at advertise at GCNlive.com and an experienced advertising executive will help you take the first step towards driving more customers to your business or website. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of HB extract. It's extremely effective and it starts working in just days. Visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers. And we've never increased our price in over 10 years. That makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it. A healthy heart is a happy heart. Call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Chris Aubeck, you want to follow up and continue on the answer to the last question? Yeah, I was saying that it's very interesting and uh, and it's a religious apparition in a sense, at least it would be for a reverend who sees uh, a kind of a woman very easily interpreted as as a virgin. So here we have a kind of um, halfway enigma, something between a religious religious experience and a UFO one, which is something we find uh, a great deal in, 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 in ufology. Chris B. Well, we have a question here from Burnt State. He's one of our uh, longtime posters at forum.theparacast.com, where you can ask our uh, guest questions uh, by going to our forums on the question thread. And Burnt State has a very interesting question here, and I'm, well, I'm very intrigued by, uh, by what your answer will be. Have you discovered any specific symbols, inscriptions, or other odd forms of communication and representations seen on crafts, uniforms, or elsewhere that stand out to you as being truly significant. Now, of course, we have in the modern era, the Umo case, the Lonnie Zamora case, where symbols were seen uh, on the craft. Do we see this type of detail in some of the more ancient historical cases? Um, yeah, there are. Uh, generally speaking, however, they didn't describe the the hieroglyphics or the characters. They just said there were hieroglyphics, which is um, quite normal in a sense, because we're talking about generally people who hadn't studied and they were often illiterate. I mean, looking back uh, 200, 300 years, and they would have said it carried some kind of weird writing, but they didn't describe those characters. On the other hand, I am writing, uh, I'm, well, I'm finished now, uh, a book which is called Alien Artifacts, and it describes stories of objects uh, that have fallen from the sky from around the 1850s onwards, well, 1840 as we'll say, many of which did supposedly carry uh, hieroglyphics on them. And this is a very old theme. You can look back at um, ancient uh, or medieval Chinese writings of of, uh, objects that come from the sky uh, full of characters and hieroglyphics that only specialists could understand or nobody could understand. And they often call it the sky language, the space language. Unfortunately, the, um, there's there's no uh, there's no way to know exactly what these characters look like because they were practically never described. You brought up a, a really interesting point, and that is China, the largest UFO group in the world, is over a million members uh, located in China, and here in the West, we don't really see a lot of the historical reports uh, in books and in in the literature 
about Asian cases. What are some of the more compelling historical cases from China, Japan, and from from the Far East? Um, well, it's very difficult to answer that question because um, we don't get to see many either. We don't have any members of the group in China or Japan. We've had them, uh, but they they post like one or two things and disappear. I don't know whether it's um, because they find the subject uh, just of fleeting interest or whether it's because of the language barrier. I'm not sure. Uh, so it's very difficult to answer that question. What What is interesting for me is uh, that the, the idea that the universe was um, populated by intelligent beings is equally old in uh, medieval China and Japan and so on as it is um, in Europe uh, because we've speculated about uh, the possibility that the universe is full of life since the ancient Greeks. It's been a, you know, a, a, an important theory discussed by philosophers and scholars over the centuries. This is nothing new at all. So um, there's a, there is room there for speculation of this kind over the centuries. But we, we just haven't received um, enough material from from people in Asia. It, it's it's something that I really would like to see. There is science fiction in in Asia, even about invasions of people on the moon, uh, for, for, from the moon, and so on. So I mean, this is it, it is an idea which which does go back to at least the 14th century in uh, in Asian uh, books. And um, I started studying Chinese a few years ago, and uh, hopefully in about 150 years, I'll have a good enough <laughs> level to, to, you know, to sort of pick up these old medieval manuscripts and have a look for myself. Or hopefully Google have, will have advanced uh, you know, far enough by then to have uh, made translation, automatic translation, uh, quite easy, which would probably mean that I'd lose my job. But still, it, it, it's what I'm looking for, really. I mean, we need this kind of information. <laughs> You're funny in a, a very dry kind of way. <laughs> yeah, the translation function on Google is um, sometimes worth uh, a few belly laughs at uh, how how certain things are translated. Well, here's a question from Flatwoods, uh, who's been a longtime poster at forum.theparacast.com, but he very rarely comes out of the woodwork to ask questions of our guests, and he did for you. And he's wondering, have there been any sightings of UFOs or their occupants uh, which correlate to historical outbreaks of famine or disease? Good question. Um, well, there is in a sense. I mean, there was this uh, book written uh, some years ago called Gods of Eden by a guy called William Bramley. He was a pseudonym. No one knows exactly who he was, as far as I know. And he correlated um, sightings of UFOs with uh, the plague and things like that. Because it is true that people at some point thought that uh, comets in particular brought the plague with them. I mean, the whole idea of uh, viruses from space and panspermia too, which isn't necessarily a virus, it's just a, a biological. Um, this is extremely old too. We can find evidence of this in very, very old books and, and writings. So, I mean, yeah, there is is, um, there is indication that people during outbreaks of plague would look uh, deliberately for some kind of cause, which would include lights in the sky or strange objects. I think that it's the same thing as happened uh, during the, the airship wave, which was mainly just um, newspapers and inventing stories. But it did make people go out of their houses and start looking up at the sky. And during that period, there were a lot of very interesting uh, sightings of, of things that didn't look particularly like wooden airships, but they were recorded because they were popular. So you can imagine that um, anything seen in the sky in, in the sky that coincided with famines, but not only with famines, but also with warfare, uh, important births, uh, deaths of monarchs, and so on. Yeah, it would be recorded because it coincided. And we, we find that in many uh, old pamphlets uh, where they describe um, the, uh, I don't know, the arrival of, a, of an enemy soldier or troop or something or army on, in, in some territory with a comet in the sky, a new comet or a new star that had appeared. So, yeah, sure, viruses, famines and so on. It, it doesn't mean that there's a there's a causation. It doesn't mean that there's any causation there. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but it made people look up in the sky and and take note. 
Let's take note of this. We have Chris Aubeck joining us. We're looking at UFOs in antiquity, mostly older UFO cases, predominantly those before the late 19th century. We've got a lot more to come in two more segments, more questions from our listeners. With Gene and Chris O, you're in the Paracast. We are America's largest independently owned communications network, GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com This alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock-bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right. General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right. That's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturing. If you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. So call 866-91-STEEL. Lock in your price now. Call 866-91-STEEL. That's 866-917-8335. Summertime is save big time at Herbal Healer Academy. Long-term customers know summer is the time to stock up at HerbalHealer.com. And for new customers, welcome to the web's best place to save on vitamins, minerals, and more. Log on for summer specials, including all sizes of colloidal silver, colloidal minerals, and intestinal freedom on sale. Choose from Herbal Healer's great variety of weight loss products like apple cider vinegar, hudia, and metabolic complex and pro-metabolic, all on sale now. Also, the anti-parasite intestinal freedom and wormwood plus complex, plus stevia liquid sweetener and the super enzymes, all on sale for summer at HerbalHealer.com. As always, we offer certificate correspondence courses in natural medicine. Enjoy same-day shipping and free online newsletter. Log on now to HerbalHealer.com and look for summer specials to save big with our nation's leader in supplying quality natural medicine and education. Since 1988, Herbal Healer Academy. Hi, this is Larry Smith. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. When the cleaners ruined some special clothing, all they could do was show us a sign that said they weren't responsible. But when they got the letter from one of our Legal Shield attorneys, he promptly gave us a check for $1,152. Worry less and live more with lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com or call 855-340-SAVE. That's 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. Hi, I'm Sam Nussbaum, WellPoint's Chief Medical Officer. We proudly support the March of Dimes mission to improve the health of babies and fight premature birth. We're helping the March of Dimes fund breakthroughs in research and community programs that help more moms have full-term pregnancies and healthy babies. Join us in working together to provide children with a healthier start in life. Visit marchofdimes.org. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. Chris Aubeck, I have a silly question to ask you here because people say all my questions are silly. All right. We know, of course, that people these days sometimes fake UFO sightings. 
sometimes fake UFO photos. It gets easier and easier to do as we get more high quality camera equipment in our smartphones and the apps with which to do the editing. Do you see evidence of any of the cases you investigated from all those years ago may, in some cases, been made up? Yeah, uh, there were quite a lot of them. I mean, um, the further you go back, uh, the, the more ambiguous it looks because um, you don't know, because normally there's no date or time or known witnesses. So the further you go back, the more mythological it gets. So it's more likely. But there are lots of cases from the 17th century, 18th century, and so on, uh, which you can divide into different categories of, uh, of falseness, of fakery. I mean, firstly, you have those which were created to, to grind a sort of political or religious acts. Uh, people wanted to, to say uh, the French are bad, for example, so um, the colours of the French flag would appear in the sky, or there were lots of battles uh, between soldiers in the sky too, which is a very common way of, of expressing um, uh, a dislike of a certain social or political situation or a battle and, and so on. So there's a lot of that going on. But then you have... Um, uh, a different category of, of phenomena, which uh, I've been looking into again with uh, Martin Martin Schoff, the British uh, ufologist, which they sometimes took a phenomenon. For example, we were looking at a case where there was a, a, a strange black cloud, a violent black cloud destroying property. And when we, I mean, we were almost willing to sort of say, well, this is definitely an anomaly. Uh, this this is very strange, this fiery black thing destroying property that seems to be intelligently controlled. But um, when when he was looking into this, I mean, he realized one day that it wasn't. It was a crowd of people that had been turned into a crazy black crowd, uh, a cloud, uh, almost as a kind of um, allegory or, or or something. So people reading this read about a phenomenon, but in fact, uh, what had happened was a, a social phenomenon. It was just a, it's as if you just called the crowds of people at a music concert uh, a one big monster. That was that. Then you have other cases which um, were of people who were um, sending off uh, fire balloons, which were very popular at one point. Not everyone knew what a fire balloon was, so they'd be saying, my God, we're seeing a planet that's come out of its orbit or a star that's come out of its orbit and doing strange things. Then there were deliberate um, attempts to confuse people by, by sending up fire balloons in strange moments, and they often exploded or something. And uh, then... <laughs> That's still going years. on today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, very little has changed. I mean, but really, if, if you look at all these different subjects, whether it's um, playing with cattle or abductions and so on. I mean, the, in the case of Jane Laird that I mentioned before, she talks about abductions, babies, everything that you might find in a Whitley Stryber book. I mean, practically everything that you find today was happening then. The, the Malleus Maleficarum was a, was a, uh, a book uh, to help find witches and uh, interpret witch behavior in the 15th century, I think it was 1485. There, this whole book is, is almost a perfect parallel with um, with um, strange things, including UFO abductions and so on, seen today. And people were sending off uh, objects into the sky uh, in the 19th century to to confuse. I mean, at that time, it wasn't to to get anyone to believe that this was about extraterrestrials. It was mainly just as a joke to see what the scientists would say. Well, we're talking about. Uh kind of a political and, and socio-religious agendas that may be attached to some ancient UFO reports. Whenever uh, someone like myself or many of our listeners go online to look at ancient UFO reports, invariably we, we will encounter uh, the alleged sighting of flaming shields by Alexander's army. And um, the details uh, differ. I've seen two different accounts. I'm not sure um, you know, how they separate out. But uh, yeah, I seem to remember that you kind of debunked this in your book. And do you want to give us a little thumbnail sketch of the popular uh, version of this story and then what your research actually determined? Yeah, I don't have it in front of me right now, so I, I have to find it. Uh, I mean, I can tell you something about it a little bit. I mean, as far as I recall, the story of uh, Alexander and the Flaming Shields, I, I remember looking for this about uh, 15 years ago and I couldn't find it. 
And um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Yanis uh, Delianis, French historian, who's helped a lot uh, with um, with me and Jake's in, in our in our writings and research, uh, he he wrote about this on his website and, and said that he'd looked into this and found that it was probably a story invented in nineteen. 50s or 60s by ufologists. So um, there's not a great deal to say about the about any authentic stories of of strange shields seen by Alexander the Great. But I mean, there are other uh, Roman chronicles that describe um, um, shields and things in the sky, which are of are of interest. We we do look into those in in the book. So uh, it's important to distinguish what is uh, modern invention and fantasy from uh, old sightings or fantasy but um it, it's 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 important at least to know what was invented by modern ufologists you know so i don't have the details with me but that's the basic idea yeah i've always wondered about that myself because it seemed too pat <laughs> you know it seemed to uh it, it seemed contrived to me always when I, whenever i would see reference to it i have another question well, uh, here from polterwurst I was going to and say he's that wondering that about to... why did you include a shell-shaped floating sea monster sighted by the crew of the Nigeria ship in 1813? It's the only report that doesn't include something in the sky or coming from or ascending into the sky or whirling or zipping around in it. Give us your thinking on why that particular case was included. Um, it uh, it was rec- it was included um, uh, not for any good reason at all, and it's not being included in the next edition. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, he also goes on. He, he has a whole list of questions, several of which we've uh, already asked, but he really thanks you for all the time and effort that you've dedicated, uh, you know, for this fascinating subject in your work. Now, obviously, we're going with this next question outside of your purview in terms of, you know, citing reports b- before 1879 or the... Um, the age of flight, basically. But he's wondering about Foo Fighters, uh, these intelligent balls of light, which have often been described as moving purposefully and and intelligently. And he says that they're obviously not exclusively a World War II phenomenon on their own, but part of a greater phenomenon of what he would call intelligent lights that has accompanied us throughout history, as some of the descriptions in uh, in Wonders in the Sky would indicate. Uh, these sacred lamps, ghost lights, mystery lights, the Hasdalen phenomenon, the Brown Mountain lights, Marfa lights, the Min Min lights. What what do you make of this? And do you think that there's some sort of possible, un, as yet undefined natural phenomena that may be uh, somehow being misinterpreted, uh, even in the modern day, for UFO activity? And how much of these potential misidentified you know, earthbound phenomena, do you think has contributed to the reports that you and uh, Jacques Vallée featured in Wonders in the Sky? Well, it's it's a very difficult question. In a sense, Wonders in the Sky was like a, a first attempt to bring together as many reports of, uh, of potential UFO uh, phenomena you know, that we could find in historical sources after eliminating thousands, I mean, literally thousands of cases. I mean, most of the things that you see on the internet are just not real. They're, they're just empty of content and then they're completely useless. Uh, so it, 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 it took us a long time to go through all those. What we're left with is um, a set of uh, well, so several hundred cases in the book, uh, which seem to indicate um, something that we we don't we we would not be able to explain it uh, scientifically, and uh, we are revising the book for another edition uh, in the future, and uh, we'll be taking out some cases and adding some some new ones, but. Um, Basically, the, the these earthlights. I mean, there are there are many geophysical explanations for them, and they of course coincide with earthquakes and uh, and other earth earth movements. Let's go look at the earthlights in our next segment with Chris Aubeck and Gene and Chris O. You're in the Paracast. A little right, a little left, but always independent minded. The Genesis Communications Network, GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. 
A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just 19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Have you heard? Proactive Plus is faster and better than ever. Stay tuned for a million bottle giveaway and you'll also receive free shipping. Do you have troubled skin? Acne? Well, we have great news. With Proactive Plus, your acne can heal and you can help prevent new breakouts from happening. Don't miss this limited time offer. Give us a call at 800-538-5252 because we're going to let a million people try Proactive Plus risk-free and get two free gifts and also receive free shipping when you call right now. You heard it. This offer won't last long. So call Proactive Plus now and you'll receive a 60-day risk-free trial of Proactive Plus, two free extras, and free shipping. Call 800-538-5252. This is our exclusive radio offer, never on TV. Get your risk-free 60-day trial of Proactive Plus with free shipping. That's right, free shipping. Don't wait. Call 800-538-5252. That's 800-538-5252. Hi, my name is Richard Dolan. You're listening to the Paracast. Earth lights, sometimes considered part of the UFO mystery, but quite likely maybe not. Chris Aubeck, continue, please. Well, basically, it's um, the these are luminous phenomena which. Uh, caused by uh, seismic activity, uh, tectonic stress, and so on. And they're, they're seen in connection with, with earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, so this is something that we have to, to examine. As I said, uh, wonders in the sky is really just a first step in, in the right direction. In future works, we're going to look uh, much more deeply at this. Um, uh, what I'm doing with uh, Martin Schoff, for example, is, is seeing whether uh, any of the lights uh, seen by people um, appeared 
in areas known for tectonic stress. And it's, it's interesting that quite often they are. But then in other cases, they're not. So um, if, if, if we're going to blame uh, something on ball lightning, at least there has to be some kind of uh, reason to believe that lightning would have occurred at that point. And if we think that it's earth lights, again, we have to look for some kind of mechanism there, or at least the area has to be known for, them, for tectonic stress. So um, it's not always easy, but uh, this is... Uh, work in progress. So hopefully one day we'll have a better idea of uh, what's going on. We're going to go through a cross section of quick subjects. This is our final segment, Chris Obeck. So let me ask you here, do you have a particular all time favorite case that you would consider one of high strangeness? Um, well, there are so many cases of high strangeness. And, you know, um, some some of my favorite cases are not necessarily the the, the strangest, but they're, they're interesting uh, for other reasons, you know, because uh, they just contain so many components of, of modern cases. For example, we have uh, one from uh, 1899, which I quite like, which um, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. McKinnon sees uh, from a distance uh, a kind of um, disc, and it's actually a disc. He describes it with this shape, and it passes in front of him across the countryside. And so there we have the, the classic uh, the flying saucer shape, perhaps. There are some stories which uh, resemble, uh, at least superficially, um, a UFO crash of some kind. For example, there's one uh, from, from Prague in uh, 1571, which, at least reading it, it it does evoke images from, I don't know, some kind of UFO retrieval. I mean, it doesn't have to be that, but it's just the way that it sounds. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you and you can, you can come to your own conclusion. This is from the 20th, the 20th of July, 1571, uh, from Prague. And this is a, a genuine document. And it says, uh, about midnight, there was a great wind over Prague that made such a rumbling noise that it sounded like an earthquake. The people woke up with a start and hurried to the windows. Looking towards the cattle fair, today Charles Square, they saw a marching army coming along Spalina Street. The soldiers held their weapons in their hands and witnesses found their appearance somewhat unnerving. Behind the soldiers came something resembling a large round chariot drawn by oxen. The object, which made a loud noise, was apparently made of metal and had no wheels. Eight large human figures marched behind the vehicle. They looked frightful because they had no faces, but wore enormous spurs on their feet, adding to the noise. Once they crossed the square, a great fire appeared on the ground in front of the Church of the Sacred Heart. On one side of the fire, there were a large number of boxes, and on the other, there were barrels. These barrels looked as if they could have been used to transport gunpowder. The big chariot arrived near the fire, and all the boxes and barrels were thrown on it. Then again, a frightful wind arose at the same time as a kind of rain of fire, and all this horrifying vision disappeared. However, a luminous object could be made out in the air, a circle of fire that persisted until dawn. Uh, oh, then it says that uh, that year there was a great famine and many people died. Uh, so um, whatever this was that people saw, this large round metal object being dragged in the street by soldiers and strange figures without faces, giants walking behind it that suddenly disappeared, just leaving a circle of fire. People did think that that might be connected with the famine. That oh. sounds pretty high strange to me. <laughs> well, let me ask you quickly here, because we only have a very few minutes left, Chris Aubeck, and that is, do you see ever reaching a point in your lifetime, and it probably won't happen in mine, and since you're the young whippersnapper on the show, and we got to snap the whip here, and that is, do you ever see a final solution coming to your investigations, or is it going to be just more information for posterity? No, I'm in a sense. I've I've uh, stood back from what is uh, just general research. We have some excellent researchers in the group. I mean, it's people who are finding some of the most amazing cases. Uh, there's a, a woman called uh, Kay Massingill, who I'm going to see next week. In fact, in Ohio, and she's contributed some of the most amazing stories. I mean, really, these are just just 